Okay, hello. Uh, as you can see, my camera and everything is working properly tonight. Um, um, so I want to apologize. I think the email I sent out yesterday afternoon saying that I was going to Zoom last night was... Uh, um, I somehow sent it out wrong. I, I think I made a mistake and people in this class didn't get it, which is why some people showed up in person. And uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I think I'm going to be back in person next week, but obviously it depends what things look like on campus. Um, so this time I will make sure to send the email to everyone. <laughs> and... Um, so please keep your eye on that on Monday to see what's going on. All right. Um, and with no further ado, I will move on to start discussing Barclay. Um, I think because we're finally done with Locke. Thanks, heavens, you're probably saying. Well, I love Locke. But this is year 1685 to 1753. Um, the book we're reading, The Principles, as it's usually called, right? So the name is actually the, the name, A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. Um, as I think I mentioned before, like uh, all these empiricists wrote books with almost exactly the same name. <laughs> so an essay concerning human understanding, a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge, a treatise of human nature, you know, whatever. So anyway, this one we call we call the the principles, and uh, the principles was published in seventeen ten, right? So when Barclay was pretty young. Um, this is just for context. Um, Locke's essay was published in 1690 and Locke died in 1704. So this is 20 years after the publication of the essay and six years after Locke's death. Um, what should I say about Barclay? Um, uh, he's, I think, correctly described as Anglo-Irish. <laughs> um, as I, as I think I mentioned at the beginning of the course, he was born in a castle in Ireland. He's basically was part of the, you know, English occupation of Ireland. <laughs> um, uh, um. And he was a uh, uh, Protestant, basically an Anglican, uh, not a Catholic. Um, and uh, he published the principles and also his book on vision, um, both when he was relatively young and while he was still in Ireland. Um, after that, he spent some time in England and Europe. Um, back in Ireland, and uh, and it was only at that time, like when he went back to Ireland for a while, that when he first became an Anglican priest. Um, so when he wrote this book, he was not, um, let alone was he a bishop. He became the Bishop of Cloyne, that is the a bishop in the Church of Ireland, which is basically, was basically the Anglican Church in Ireland. <laughs> right. So he was made Bishop of Cloyne in 1734. So a long time after he wrote this book. So you'll often hear him referred to as Bishop Barclay, but he wasn't actually a bishop when he wrote this. And he was an Anglican bishop. Um, anyway, so after after that, after that time back in Ireland, he went to America for a while. 
um, in Rhode Island. He, he lived in Rhode Island. Um, it was, I guess, uh, during that stay in Rhode Island that he made some uh, like statement about the great future he expected for philosophy in America or something like that, which is why the University of California was campus was named Berkeley, it should be, but we pronounce it Berkeley. <laughs> uh, and then the town was named after that. Um, it was also while he was in Rhode Island when he stayed there. He did, So he was staying there. Um, I used to be confused about this. So he his plan was to found a college in Bermuda. Um, and he expected to get funding from Parliament to found a college in Bermuda but the funding never came through. So I used to think, which would make sense, that he must have been waiting for the funding in Bermuda. But uh, no, he was waiting in Rhode Island. That's where he was. I don't know. Anyway, while he was there, he didn't stay in a hotel. He stayed on a plantation. Um, and uh, um, as part of that, he owned slaves. So uh, that's something to keep in mind about him. Uh, moreover, unlike Locke, I think we can't really say it was inconsistent with his political philosophy. His political philosophy, which we won't really be touching on at all in this course, but his his political philosophy was very, uh, um, well, he was a proponent of what's called passive obedience, which means that like there is no right to rebel against the government ever. <laughs> So uh, um, his political philosophy was relatively uh, conservative, I guess you'd say, um, in a maybe, well, in what to you, at least to us really seems like a bad way. Um, but in any case, the parliamentary funding for the college in Bermuda never came through, and he went back to England, and then he was made Bishop of Cloyne in 1734. He returned to Ireland, and he stayed there for basically the rest of his life. And he wrote some other books, um, including a book I've never re read, but I keep meaning to read, which is called Cirrus or the Virtue of Tar Water, <laughs> where, which is a combination of trying to uh, sell people on the wonderful virtues of tar water, which is, I don't know, some kind of water that's made from pine sap or so i don't know anyway it's some disgusting thing that he thought cured all diseases or whatever but uh but then it also is supposed to move the reader step by step to the contemplation of god <laughs> so it must be a very strange book and i keep meaning to read it but i haven't all right um so that's all i have to say about barclay in general i guess i should also say that um, although what he says about children in this book is pretty nasty, actually. Now, I guess a question. When, so unlike Locke or Hume, Barclay was married and had children. I don't know if his children were born before or after he wrote this book, though. That's an important question. Oh, well. I'm not going to look it up on Wikipedia right now. All right. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about Barclay's biography. Um, about this book, The Principles. So it has an introduction in part one. And no part two. <laughs> part two was never published. So um, part two apparently was supposed to be about ethics and free will. Um, although I'm not sure how we actually know that. Um, I actually write like earlier this afternoon was like trying to figure out how we know that by Googling and stuff. And I didn't turn anything up. So then I asked ChatGPT and ChatGPT said, oh, we know from this letter of Barclay to so-and-so of, you know, November 25th, 1710. 
But unfortunately, it seems like that was a chat GPT hallucination because there doesn't seem to be such a letter. So I still don't know how we know, but I think but it was supposed to be about ethics and free will. It would and therefore it would be about less about ideas and more about spirits. Um, I mean, we'll come to that division later on. So uh Barclay actually apparently claimed to have written a lot of part two. But he lost the manuscript while he was traveling in Italy, and he didn't want to write it again. So there is no part two. <laughs> so it's a little weird, right? Because he like, um, there are sections of the introduction and sections of part one, but even though there's only one part. <laughs> um. Okay, so um, no, am I out of focus again? No, I'm not gonna start fooling with the camera. I remember what happened last time. I just, can you read it? Well, maybe I should. Yeah. Maybe I should. Yay. Worked. All right. To, to fix what was going wrong last time, by the way, I had to restart the computer. Nothing else worked. <laughs> Anyway, um, all right, so um, so now I'm gonna say something just kind of like in general about Barclay's, at least Barclay's political, I mean, uh, theoretical philosophy, which is what we're gonna be dealing with. Um, so the basic thought is, which he says uh, at the very beginning of the introduction, as soon as we leave common sense and start to think for ourselves, think more carefully, um, we always run into quote unquote uncouth paradoxes. So Barclay says, how can that be? Well, it can't be because the faculties God has given us are themselves defective. Right? So Descartes' God is not a deceiver argument is like working in the background here. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly how Barclay could show that or what it would even mean if Barclay showed it. Um, but he does seem to be assuming it. So... Um, it must be that um, our faculties are fine, but we started from false principles, right? So if you, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? If you start from a false principle, then no matter how carefully you think and whatever, you're going to get an absurd, or you could get an absurd consequence. So that's why this book is called The Principles, right? Or a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge. Um, because um, Barclay thinks that false principles have gotten us into trouble in philosophy and we need to get rid of them and start with true principles. So there are um, two main false principles. And one of them is discussed in the introduction and the other is discussed in part one. But I'm gonna start introducing both of them a little bit today. Um, but, right, so these are the two false principles. And they have something in common and they seem to be connected to each other somehow too. Um, what they have in common is 
that they both involve attributing to the understanding that is to the intellect or faculty of perceiving an ideas um an impossible power to free itself from sense to free itself from the basis of perception um so i think like i mean i said i'm going to talk about broccoli's theoretical philosophy but there's a practical point behind this like the root of both of them is our like false pride in our own abilities or vanity or something like that we we convince ourselves that we can do something that not only can't we do but it's absurd um and this is why it happens when we leave common sense, right? Because the ordinary, illiterate, commonsensical people don't like think they have any special powers of thought or anything. Um, and so they don't get into trouble. But the people who who like say, oh, I'm going to, you know, think more carefully and consider better fall into this trap of attributing to themselves powers which they don't have and which no one could have, right? I mean, this is a big difference between Berkeley and Locke. Locke keeps saying how our faculties are, are very narrow and, um, and that limits what we can know. But Locke usually, like often in the same breath will mention that other beings like angels who are better than us may ha not have that restriction, right? So Locke is talking about, about our having defective faculties, defective from the point of view that um, they won't help us answer the questions we really want the answers to. Um, so whereas Barclay is saying, there's nothing wrong with our faculties at all. The things we can't do are things that are impossible. <laughs> um, and the, the problem is not with our faculties that we receive from God. The problem is with our, you know, false pride and vanity that, that leads us to think we can do these things that we can't. Okay, so what are the, what are the things that we think we can do? So the first one, so they both basically the first one has to do with ideas, and the second one has to do with propositions. And the first one is that we can form abstract ideas. So obviously you can see this is aimed on a collision course against Locke. And not by coincidence, Locke is Barclay's main opponent throughout the book, right? I mean, sometimes he may be thinking about Descartes or some other people, but, uh, um, and sometimes he mentions the scholastics, but always just along the lines of, of course, everyone knows there's nothing interesting there, right? Like he never mentions any details of what the scholastics think. So um, um, despite the fact that he claims to be arguing against all philosophers ever and what, you know, it's agreed on all hands is something he often says, but the proof that it's agreed on all hands is usually a quote from Locke. <laughs> Right. So it's basically Barclay against Locke. Um, so, right. So here's something Locke thinks we can do. And Locke thinks it's the, the, one of our most important abilities. It's the thing that sets us out from the non-human animals. It's the thing that allows us to use language, et cetera, et cetera. And Barclay says, this is just absurd. And you see why I say forming an abstract idea as a way of like freeing yourself from sense, right? That is, um, sensible things are all particulars. But when we use abstract ideas instead, we're not thinking of any particular. That's the thought. And that's exactly what Barclay says we can't do. Um,
And in the case of propositions, that is the constituents of knowledge, the power that we think we have that we don't is that we, we can infer or even suppose um, uh, immediate external objects. Um, beyond the immediate one, beyond the immediately sensible one. <laughs> right, so, um, and again, this is, um, I mean, I guess I should say, I mean, it's true that Locke isn't the only one who thinks we can form abstract ideas. I mean, Barclay is right that everyone basically thinks we can form abstract ideas. It's just that he's really only arguing in detail against Locke. And the same thing goes here, right? Like everyone basically agrees other than Barclay <laughs> that besides um, like whatever um internal representations or whatever we have there are also external objects that cause them that are not part of our mind that are um may not themselves be minds um um or have minds uh and uh again barclay says that's impossible, but the specific version of it he's arguing against is Locke's, Locke's double object theory, right? That is, remember, Locke says the immediate object of perception is always an idea, but the act of perception is caused by an ex immediate external object, which causes me to perceive this idea, and that's what makes this the object referred to by the idea. Um, so Barclay says, no, you can't infer that there's another object out here, and you can't even suppose it without absurdity. And so, right, Barclay says these are both absurd powers, supposed powers. And so, uh, in a sense, no one has ever really believed in them. Um, but for various reasons, but again, I guess I would say the fundamental reason is pride and vanity, right? That people uh, who think themselves above plain common sense have pretended to believe in them. And in that way, they've deceived others and often even deceived themselves. Um now, I mean, this is going to be relatively easy to make out with number one, right? I mean, you can imagine going to the plain, good common sense people and saying, you don't believe in these weird, ghostly, abstract ideas that, you know, of a triangle that is neither scalenon nor uh, isosceles or whatever, right? Um, and you can at least imagine them saying, yeah, yeah, we don't believe in those mysterious abstract ideas, right? This one is going to be a harder sell, right? When you when you go to the common people and you say, um, you don't believe that there's like material objects that are independent of your mind that exist even when no one's perceiving them, do you? That's just, you know, something metaphysicians believe in. And they, you know, they're going to be like, what? <laughs> right. So, um, uh, so Barclay has his work cut out for him trying to show that this also is, is it's plain common sense that this is just absurd. Um, but as I said, the introduction is basically about this one. And part one is basically about this one. So mostly today I'm going to be talking about this one. Okay, are there any questions so far?
Um, okay. Um, okay, so what do Bart Locke and Barclay actually disagree about? This is something that, well, I think it, it could be really hard to understand, except I hope that talking about Locke, that I've kind of prepared the way for my explanation of what they what it is they really disagree about. But like, it's not easy to put your finger on it. And what's worse, it seems easy, but then when you think about it more, you realize it's not, right? So um, um, what's worse, or from a certain point of view, what's better, right? Like, for example, you know, like if people try to understand in the final paper assignment, when I, you know, um, and asking you to, write something about like comparing two of the authors somehow and say something um, original about it. Now, of course, I don't mean original in the sense that no one's ever said it, but I mean, that's your idea, right? Like who knows what people have said somewhere, but um, right. So, um, um, uh, but um, but that doesn't mean like um, saying which one is right. If you wanted, if you were interested in the project of saying which one is right, which you probably shouldn't be because neither of them is right. <laughs> but if you were interested in that project, you know, you would kind of, I mean, it's really more complicated than this, but you would kind of have to do the other project first, right? First figure out what they're really arguing about. Then you could decide which one is right. Um, so, uh, you know, and moreover, it's like, it's not a matter of just saying what one of them says and then saying what the other one says. There's something original to say about what they disagree about. Well, that, you know, and so that's, or what they agree about. And, you know, and that's, that's because, like, it's not easy to tell. <laughs> so this is an example I'm going through of that, why, why it's not easy to tell, right? So, um, so, okay, Barclay starts talking about this. Page nine, section seven of the introduction. It is agreed on all hands, right? This is one of these times that I was talking about. If it's not only here, as he likes this expression, it is agreed on all hands, but it basically means lock. <laughs> Or I guess you could say it means even Locke agrees, right? It is agreed on all hands that the qualities or modes of things do never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all others. So... Um, So that's going to be the agreement, right? Locke and I both agree that uh, the qualities or modes of things never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all others. So the illusion appears to be to this passage that I kept emphasizing in Locke, um, book two, chapter two, section one on page 121, When I see, I say appears to be because although, you know, Barclay does like quote and amazingly with a footnote that gives you the place that he's quoting, <laughs> does does quote Locke several times here. This this isn't one of them, right? So I'm, but it sounds like he's alluding to this passage. Um, 
though the qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. Oops, I was pointing to something you couldn't see. Let me try that again. Though the qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. And then, so apparently, we should think that that's the part they agree about. And then what do they disagree about? Well, Locke says, yet tis plain the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses simple and unmixed. Um, so that's how Locke actually continues in that passage. Now here's how Barclay continues in the passage I was reading before on page nine. Introduction, section seven. But we are told the mind being able to consider each quality singly or abstracted from those other qualities with which it is united does by that means frame to itself abstract ideas. So like this kind of a mismatch here Locke is saying, so like, here's the snowball. In the snowball, the whiteness and the cold are united and it are inseparably united and so to speak, mixed and blended. Right, you can't take them apart from each other. Um, they're, you know, um, they're both consequences of the microscopic structure of the snowball. Um, I mean, the truth is they're both consequences of the not quite microscopic structure of the snowball. It's because the snowball is made of little pieces of ice, but... Um, So, um, so the whiteness and the coldness are inseparably mixed inside the snowball. Now, here's the mind. And Locke says, these qualities enter the mind simple and unmixed. Right, so here's the idea of white, and here's the idea of cold. I assume when he says the qualities enter the mind, of course, the qualities don't really enter the mind, right? That would mean the mind becomes white and cold. <laughs> um, uh, it means their ideas enter the mind. That is, the mind perceives their ideas, right? And the mind perceives their ideas, again, because the object, that is the snowball, causes these acts of perception. Right, so this is Locke. Now, right, and it was at this point that I, um, um, in talking about Locke that I said, if you wanna call this abstraction, it doesn't happen in the mind at all. Right? It happens between the snowball and the mind. It's done by the sense organs. Right? Like my eye is affected one way by particles that are coming off the snowball or whatever. And my skin is affected another way by the snowball. And um, 
even though the qualities that cause those two effects are inseparably blended in the snowball, those are two different effects in my different sense organs, and they cause different ideas to be perceived in my mind. So, but, so as, when the, they, the, the ideas enter the mind, simple and unmixed, they're never blended together in the mind. They were blended together in the object. Now, of course, um, Barclay is going to say that, and this is why I said that the two false principles are related to each other, and you can't quite talk about the introduction without already thinking about what he's going to say in part one, that, of course, Barclay is going to erase this whole part of the picture. Right? There's only ideas in my mind. There's no, there's nothing out here that they that causes them or that they refer to. That's why Barclay is called an idealist, right? Okay, uh, an extreme idealist, or, or sometimes called a subjective idealist, or sometimes called a Barclayan idealist. Right? So, um, right there, all there is is ideas in my mind. Um, but what exactly does he disagree with Locke about then? Well, you know, he must disagree with Locke about the separability of ideas. That is, there must be ideas that Locke thinks enter the mind simple and unmixed that Barclay think enter the mind inextricably blended. So if white and cold were examples of that, we would have here a picture in the mind of one idea that is both white and cold. And you can't take them apart in the mind. So, like, I mean, this way of look, this way of portraying the, you know, whereas at first you might think it's just, it's clear, they, you know, they both agree that white and cold are combined in the snowball, but Locke thinks we can take them apart after they've entered the mind, whereas Barclay thinks we have no such power. The truth is, Barclay has to, um, Locke doesn't think we can take them apart after they've entered the mind. Locke thinks they enter the mind already apart. And moreover, like I started by saying, if you call this abstraction, it doesn't happen in the mind at all. But remember, I, you know, argued that Locke, this isn't what Locke calls it's abstraction. Mm -hmm. These, these ideas, in fact, are still, like when the infant receives ideas like this, they're still particular. This, I, this white idea is the idea of this white thing. It's not the idea of white things in general. Now that has something to do with the way it's connected to the idea of existence or something like that, so I'll, but I'll come back to that. Okay, so um, so then the question is though, what does Barclay think is inseparably blended? Like, for example, is white and cold a good an example of that? And you know, I mean, it should be if he's alluding to this passage, right? Because. Um, well, uh, I guess it's actually a piece of ice here, not a snowball. The coldness and hardness which a man feels in a piece of ice. But he uses a snowball as an example somewhere. All right, anyway. Um, 
you might think it was an example. It's, it sounds like the examples that Locke gives in that passage, but is this really, an, is white and cold really an example of the things that Barclay thinks are inseparable? Well, so now I am gonna get a little bit ahead of us and read something from the near the beginning of part one. So, um, This is from section one of part one on page 23. So before this, he's been talking about ideas that come through various senses, like white and cold and so forth, right? And he says, and as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. Thus, for example, a certain color, taste, smell, figure, and consistence have been observed to go together, are accounted one distinct thing, signified by the name apple. So that doesn't sound like they're inseparably blended. Right? How did we form? It sounds a lot like uh, Locke's account of how we formed the complex idea of Apple. We took these different ideas, which we observed to always go together, and decided to consider them all as, as one thing and assign them a name. Um. And um, moreover, later on in part one, Barclay says, um, first in section five on page 25, he gives an example of the kind of thing that, um, the kind of, so to speak, abstraction that he doesn't deny we can perform. Right, I mean, it starts, so here's the bo the bottom of page 24. Again, this is part one, section five. Thus, I imagine the trunk of the human body without the limbs, or conceive the smell of a rose without thinking on the rose itself. Now, by the rose itself here, he must mean what? Like the visible rose. Right? I mean, remember, he doesn't think there's a rose that's different from my ideas of the rose um, that you could call the rose itself. So by the rose itself, he must mean the visible rose or the tangible rose, right? So I can think of the rose's smell without the rose's visible or tangible properties. So far, I will, do not, I will not deny that I can abstract if that may properly be called abstraction, which extends only to the conceiving separately such objects as it is possible may really exist or be actually perceived asunder. Right? So it's possible to smell a rose without seeing it or without feeling it. Um, and similarly, it's possible to see a rose without feeling it or feel a rose without seeing it. So all those ideas are ideas that can possibly exist separately. So even if I happen to be perceiving them together, I can imagine one of them without the others. And Barclay says, that's not the kind of thing that I'm trying to rule out in calling abstraction. So, but white and cold seem to be, perfect, you know, the exact same thing. Right, I can see the white of the snowball, football. <laughs> I can see the white of the snowball without feeling the cold. Um, I can feel the cold without seeing the white. So even if right now I'm feeling the cold and seeing the white, I can imagine them separately from each other, according to Barclay. So I can make that kind of abstraction.
Right, and he said that already in the introduction, section 10 on page 11. To be plain, I own myself able to abstract in one sense, as when I consider some particular parts or qualities separated from others, with which, though they are united in some object, yet it is possible they may really exist without them. Right? So again, the snowball seems to be a perfect case of that. The cold and the white are united, happen to be united in some object but it's possible that they may exist without each other. And so uh, there's no, if I, if I imagine one without the other, that's not abstraction in the bad sense. So it turns out actually that most of the ideas that Locke thinks you can separate from each other and not only can separate from each other, but again, they come in separate. Right. It, 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 it turns out that most of those ideas Locke and Barclay agree about. And in fact, I think we're left with only a few cases where Barclay and Locke actually disagree about the separability of ideas. Right. And again, it's the separability of ideas they have to be arguing about here because you know, the place where Locke agrees that things are inseparable is not an idea at all. It's an external object that Locke, that Barclay doesn't even believe in. So what they have to be arguing about is whether certain ideas are inseparable or not. So, I mean, fuck my race. All right. Um, so I know, I only know of a few cases, actually, where they clearly disagree. And they're all kind of weird cases in Locke already, but they're also all kind of important. Um, so the first one is abstraction from simple ideas. For example, if I um, form the idea of color by abstracting from the individual colors like white and black and green and whatever. Um, so Barclay definitely says that's impossible. The problem though with that is that um, it's not clear how Locke thinks that's possible, right? And certainly not by separating different parts of these ideas because they're simple ideas. They don't have different parts. <laughs> um, and I mean, Locke does talk about that type of abstract idea. Um, he even like, he says what the abstract idea of color is. And, um, and I don't know if this is a general model for how he thinks about this, but he, he says something like the abstract idea of color is that of an idea that uh, enters by vision only or something like that. Right. So it turns out that when we that, that when we perform this quote unquote abstraction, we're not really like taking apart pieces of these simple ideas, which is impossible. We're really like somehow going from the content of the ideas to the way we receive them, but that they have that in common, but that's not a component of them, right? So, I mean, that's interesting. Um, the case is important, right? Like, uh, um, even perhaps in some sense politically important. I, I mean, re, that is Barclay's objection to the so-called abstract idea of man or of humanity. Part of his objection is, only part of it, but part of the objection is 
that this has to be the idea of a human who is has a color because every human, I guess every body, unless maybe transparent bodies don't, I don't know. But anyway, every human has a color. Um, but uh, so this abstract idea is the abstract idea of something that has a color, but it's not the idea of something that has any particular color. So it contains this type of abstraction in it as a component, right? And he says, you know, because, uh, you know, it is not true that every human is white or black or any other color. <laughs> so, um, um, so somehow, like... First of all, all of a sudden, white and black don't mean like this and this. They mean different human skin colors, right? Which are neither white nor black. They're ba basically all kind of brownish, right? <laughs> but some of them are darker. So, I mean, uh, uh, um, suddenly Barclay is thinking about that when he at, at the same time as he's worrying about the abstract idea of humanity i mean I, I don't i don't know i don't have any farther to go with that and i don't wouldn't claim that that somehow this is important to understanding why Barclay owned slaves or anything like that but it's but it just it does flag that this is not just a puzzle that there's some there could be something important here um However, I'm not going to have much more to say about this, partly because, again, as I said, it's really unclear what Locke's view about it is. So it's hard to like get a handle on what the um, disagreement could be. Okay, the second one, I mean, I guess it has two main parts, but it's it's basically like... I guess if I were to describe it abstractly, <laughs> um, well, maybe I should. It's it's more than that. That's an example of it. Yeah, I don't know. I'll just say abstraction of certain ideas of the same sense. From each other. Right, so like remember in that case of like cold and white or the smell of the rose and the way the rose looks or you know the heart, even the hardness and coldness of white, although in a sense we both, we sense both of those by touch it's not really exactly the same sense, right? Um, but uh, um, um, and though in all those cases, it seems like Locke and Barclay agree, and it seems like they have to agree, uh, right? I mean, ideas of one sense can always come without ideas of the other of another sense. I don't know, maybe there's some exception to that. But anyway, normally they can, anyway. <laughs> so, um, and if they can possibly exist separately, then Barclay's not going to deny that I can separate the ideas. But certain ideas of the same sense, and I guess there's two main examples. So one is... Um, No. Color and visible figure, right? This is an example that, that Barclay often uh, specifically, explicitly mentions. Um, so like the idea that I could imagine a body that's neither white nor black nor any other color. Um, that is, separate the shape from the color. Now, I say visible figure um, because 
I think already in Locke actually, but for sure in Berkeley, because that's what this book about vision is about. Visible figure is not really the same thing as tangible figure. Remember, I think we read this part. Actually, I'm not sure if I assigned this part in Locke where he talks about his friend uh, Molyneux who, um, who poses this question like, Suppose there was someone who was blind from birth and they learned to distinguish uh, spheres and cubes from each other by touch. And then one day they have an operation to remove their cataracts and now they can see. Um, and if you put a sphere and a cube in front of them, will they be able to tell by vision which is a sphere and which is a cube? And Molyneux says, no, they wouldn't. They would have to learn how those visible um, ideas are related to the tangible ideas. And Locke agrees. And Berkeley certainly agrees. So like, so color and visible figure is one thing. And the other is, primary qualities tangible primary qualities. And like, as uh, I mentioned several times, I think the primary qualities in Locke, even though he, he'll he often say that we also get them by vision, I think it's the tangible versions that are really the <laughs> primary qualities. Um, so, uh, because, Well, for one thing, because color is a secondary quality. Um, so, uh, well, maybe I can't argue that quickly from there, but <laughs> I think if you start from there, you could you could see why it would be weird to say that visible shape is a primary quality when color is a secondary quality. In any case, um, you know, Again, this this case is hard to talk about because I'm not sure I understand exactly what Locke thinks about it. Does Locke think we can we can imagine a shape that doesn't have a color? I mean, sometimes he talks about how if we had microscopic eyes, um, we wouldn't see colors anymore. We would only see the primary qualities of body or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, like what he thinks that vision would be like. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and, um, and similarly, I don't know, I mean, it depends on exactly what he thinks visible figure is. Um, so, you know, there are some people later in the empiricist tradition. I, is this, does Barclay say this in the book on vision? I don't think so. But there are people who say we really only see one color at a time ever. And we just move quickly. We see a quick succession of colors. And we've come to associate that succession of colors with the true feeling of extension, which we get when you like when you put your hand all at the same time on a and you feel a, a whole surface. Um anyway, so I like I don't know, I don't know exactly what Locke would say about what Locke thinks about this, and therefore. And I also, it doesn't seem to play an important role in Locke. So I don't know exactly what to do with this, but this obviously is super important. Um, okay, right, that for example, motion and figure, right? Like that's the type of thing or figure and size that is bulk, right? Are things that, Barclay will repeat over and over again that the friends of abstract ideas think we can form an abstract idea of motion, which is not the motion of any particular figure, you know, things like that. That's the kind of thing he thinks is absurd. 
And Locke definitely does think we have abstract ideas of the primary qualities. So there's a so there's another definite real uh, disagreement, and it's about something really central to Locke. Um, okay, and then finally, we get some very abstract ideas. Um. Um. If you're in 106, you might want to think of these as transcendental ideas. <laughs> but you get these very abstract ideas of which at least two ex examples, there may be a couple others, but are existence and unity. Um. So remember, Locke thinks that these are suggested by every idea we ever have. Um, so like to begin with, it's not actually clear how Locke can think that they're separable. Like, how can we consider an idea without the idea of existence or unity when the existence of ideas of existence and unity come with every idea? Um, so the answer, I think, and this is what I was talking about in Locke last time, is... Um, that you can separate the idea from, um, from the fourth type of agreement with the idea of existence. So here's my idea of white, and here's the idea of existence, right? And the fourth type of agreement between uh, ideas is right, real existence. Um, is um, um, and remember there was like there was a similar puzzle about this. How can they not agree if every idea suggests existence? And I said that the fourth type of agreement is agreement at a time. So, um, so although you can't consider the idea of white without the idea of existence, you can consider the idea of white without the idea of existence at any particular time. And that's the kind of separation or abstraction you can make. And presumably the same thing is true of the ideas of unity and perhaps power and limit also. But I mean, but I think existence is the one that we need to talk about here uh, the most because um, so, so first of all, Barclay definitely does deny that we have these very abstract ideas like existence and unity. So there's a real disagreement here. But number two, I remember I argued before that it's this kind of separation between the idea and existence at a particular time that's that's really the operation of abstraction according to Locke. Right? That's why, like, no matter how simple the idea I have is, if I'm still attaching it to a particular time, it's still a particular idea. So when the infant has the idea of sweet, it has it as the idea of something sweet now. So it's a particular idea, even though it's very, very simple, almost everything has been, so to speak, left out of it, except again, it was never there, right? It came in simple and unmixed, <laughs> but it is, it did come in with the idea of existence at a time. Right. Um, and Ray, remember how Locke describes abstraction. So I'm going back to Locke. 
again. This is book two, chapter 11, section nine on page 155. Section 11 is not, oh, section nine, sorry. Um, right, so the mind makes the particular ideas received from particular objects to become general which is done by considering them as they are in the mind, such appearances, separate from all other existences and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other concomitant ideas. Right, so it's the existence at a time, or um, at least in the case of a body, existence at a place at a time that uh, constitutes particularity, and there may be some other concomitant ideas. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what those would be, but uh, um, um, abstraction consists of making that separation. So I could have the most complicated idea possible that, like, that, um, that doesn't leave out the, a single detail about the object. But if I separate it from existence at a particular time or at a particular place at a particular time, that idea is now abstract. And similarly, if I have the, um, the simplest possible idea like white or sweet, as long as I haven't separated from existence at a time, it's not abstract. So actually, um, although Barclay and Locke don't disagree about many cases of separability of ideas, um, it's really true because of this one that Barclay uh, in general, disagrees with Locke's view that we can have abstract ideas. Right? So, in other words, what Barclay will say is absurd is just as it's absurd to consider a figure without motion or whatever, it's, it's absurd to consider something existing, but not at any particular time. Um, okay, are there questions about any of that? Um, okay, so that's, um, so, so this one is actually the most important one, I think. However, uh, it's all, this one is also pretty important. So I want to talk about that, especially because Barclay spends most of the time talking about this or about these two in the introduction. Um, so it's important and it's also related to Barclay's idealism. So this is another connection. I guess it's another connection or is it somehow the same connection? I don't remember what the first connection I mean was. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's another connection between those two parts, the introduction and part one, that is between the two false principles that Barclay is arguing against. Um, because, uh, so according to Locke's view, 
um, motion and extension, for example, that you're watching. Motion and extension are two um, distinct ideas that we can consider separately. Um, but hold on a second, Locke. Isn't Barclay right that we can't conceive of motion without extension? I mean, this is actually not a hundred percent clear. Can't we? Can we consider a you know unextended point moving or whatever? But uh, let's let's not argue about that. So, uh, uh, so isn't Barclay right that we can't conceive of motion without extending? What moves always has to be an extended thing, right? Because uh, because motion means first being in one place and then being in a different place. And to be in a place, you have to be extended. Um, so, uh, well, I don't know. I just gave that argument. Maybe that's out of place here because maybe that's more like the way Tar Descartes would explain this or something. What Barclay is saying is, when Barclay says we can't conceive of it, it doesn't mean there's, it means we can't imagine it, basically, right? Like, try to form the idea of something moving that doesn't have, without extension. You can't do it. So, um, how, so is Locke just going to say, oh, yeah, I can do that? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what Barclay imagines Locke doing, right? Like Barclay kind of imagines Locke or portrays Locke as just as like just digging in his heels and saying, "Yeah, I have this power." <laughs> and 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 Barclay says, "Well, okay, maybe you do. I can't prove you don't, but the rest of us, <laughs> right?" So. But but the truth is, I don't think Locke would, would just deny this. On the contrary, I think we know what Locke would say about this. There's a visible necessary connection between these distinct ideas. That is, that there can't be motion without extension is synthetic a priori in Kant's terminology. Right? These ideas are really distinct and they have nothing in common with each other. And yet just by having them, we can see that they must go together. Um, so, I mean, if you like, you can say that, that what Barclay takes as um, evidence that it's absurd to consider these ideas separately Locke takes as evidence that we we perceive a, ne a necessary connection between them. And then remember, if I'm right about what Locke means by primary qualities, that you know, um, it's because we perceive these these necessary connections between ideas that we're able to conclude to necessary connections in the object. Right, and that, that that is the powers that are responsible for us perceiving these two ideas must also have a necessary connection. And therefore, when we um, receive ideas of primary qualities from the object, we learn something about the object's true structure. So that's Locke's side, but now we can see that, and again, without kind of trying to decide who's right, I mean, I I, I think, um, I mean, I know Kant would say neither of them is right. <laughs> um, so uh, without trying to say who's right, I think we can see there's, there's a kind of consistency on both sides. Right, because Barclay, on the one hand, is going to say, no, there's no necessary connection between distinct ideas here. And in fact, Barclay is already going to 
um, say what Hume says about that, namely that there can be no such thing as a necessary connection between ideas. That's that's basically what he's going to mean. He's going to express by saying that ideas are inert. No idea can require the presence of another one or the absence of another one. Um, so, so Barclay's going to say, no, there's, there's no visible necessary connection between distinct ideas here. And then if you go back the other direction and have Locke say, well, Barclay, then how come I can't conceive one without the other? Barclay will say, because they're not distinct ideas. It's just one idea. <laughs> Right, it's inseparable aspects of the same idea. So I can pay attention to one rather than the other or something like that, but I can never consider them as separate. And then sure enough, that means there's no primary qualities. So that means that even if some substance caused me to have this idea, and it's going to turn out, according to Barclay, that there is a substance that caused me to have the idea. In the case of perception, the substance is going to be God, right? So there is a substance that caused me to have the idea. Nevertheless, um, the idea doesn't resemble its cause in any way. That is, there can't be this kind of analogy. Okay. Um, okay, so that's all I want to say about what they actually disagree about. Well, I don't know, maybe I, I can't draw that line. But anyway, that's all I want to say about that. And then I want to talk about um, language, right? I mean, Barclay starts the introduction by saying, you know, uh, I really want to talk about right, the, the reason this is an introduction and not itself part one is that what I really need to talk about is what's going to come up in the book, namely, as we know, his idealism, right? But he says, but before that, I decided I had to say something about language and the use of language. And I realized that in order to talk about that, I had to talk about this other error of abstract ideas. Um, because um, Barclay traces the universal error of the learned, right? So again, the ordinary common sense people don't believe in these abstract ideas, Barclay says, um, but, uh, but the learned universally believe in them. So what could explain this universal error? Um, well, and again, although it's a claim that there's a universal error, the only one he's actually thinking about is Locke, and the explanation he gives is based on Locke's view of language, right? So, um, um, so this is, I think, the wrong page. Yeah, this is section 18 of part one, but I want section 18 of the introduction, which is on page 17. Here we go. So, right, he's talking about where this error comes from. And this is one of the places where right above this, he actually cites, right, a, a specific passage in Locke. Okay, first then, it is thought that every name has or ought to have one only precise and settled signification. I guess I should stop there. So that's the first thing that leads people to believe in abstract ideas. So they think 
you know, like take the word triangle. They think that the word triangle has to always mean the same thing. And they think the thing it means has to always be an has to be an idea. What idea could it be? Right? Because triangle means I mean, this is a triangle, and this is a triangle, and this is a triangle. Um, uh, that is, this is an idea of a triangle, this is an idea of a triangle, this is an idea of a triangle. The word triangle can't mean this, because then this wouldn't be a triangle. And it can't mean this, because then this wouldn't be a triangle. So what idea does it mean, right? And then that's why they start thinking, ah, there must be an abstract idea of triangle. Okay, but why does everyone think that? <laughs> I mean, because Barclay is going to say it's not true. The word triangle means whatever triangle you're talking about. <laughs> it doesn't always mean the same thing. It always has the same definition. But the definition is itself composed of general words that, that mean different particular things in different circumstances. Right? So, um, so I think, although this isn't quite so clear, that that the reason they're led to think the learned are led to think this um, So this is. Section 19 of the introduction on page 18. The opinion that language has no other end but the communicating our ideas and that every significant name stands for an idea. Right, so now we understand and this is almost Locke's view of language. If you think that the only use of language is to communicate ideas, so one word should communicate one idea. Um, And then we get the idea, we get the idea, we get the <laughs> opinion that uh, um, that a general name must therefore signify a general abstract idea. Um, now I said this is almost Locke's view of language because remember Locke's view of language more precisely put is that language has no other proper end but the communicating our ideas, right? That is, Locke knows perfectly well, although Barclay is going to apparently accuse him of not knowing, but like Locke knows perfectly well that there's other things you can use language for. He just thinks those are abuses. <laughs> um, Okay, but I guess, I mean, you could put it a little bit differently, and it would be precisely Locke's view. It is to say, every name, so first of all, you have to leave out words that aren't names, that like particles, like is and whatever. Okay, but never mind that. <laughs> okay, so like every name, when used to signify, must be used to signify an idea. Um, the 
So that is when used significantly, it must be used to signify an idea. Now, um, so like of the, therefore of Barclay's two objections here, um, now both of these objections are, are really important to understanding what Barclay thinks about language in general. But um, but I think the first one is less relevant at exactly this point. So the first one is the one I just mentioned. Besides, the communicating ideas marked by words is not the chief and only end of language, as is commonly supposed. Right. So and then Barclay goes on to say how language can be used to excite passions and whatever without going through the medium of exciting ideas. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think moreover, Locke, Barclay thinks that exciting ideas is always only a means to something, even when it, when language does do that, right? Like, you know, if I, if I tell you, uh, give me the gold, um, then uh, what I want is not so much to have you have my have the same idea of gold that I just had. What I want is for you to give me the gold, right? So like if I can do it, if I can do it without exciting the idea of gold in your mind, that's fine. I don't care, right? Um, so um, I mean, that may seem like an extreme example, but I but I think that that the um that um really is i mean that's an overall criticism that barclay has of the way Locke thinks about the use of language however as i said i think the the one that's more significant more relevant at exactly this point is the one he makes first here um let's start a little bit farther up that's and a little attention, right? So this is section 19 of the introduction, still on page 18. And a little attention will discover that it is not necessary, even in the strictest reasonings, significant names which stand for ideas should, every time they are used, excite in the understanding the ideas they are made to stand for. In reading and discoursing, names being for the most part used as letters are in algebra, in which, though a particular quantity by mark be marked by each letter, yet to proceed right, it is not requisite that in every step each letter suggests to your thoughts that particular quantity it was appointed to stand for. Now, I don't understand exactly how he's imagining using algebra here. Um, I mean, it almost seems like, and there's some place where Locke talks about algebra where it sounds the same, but I mean, I know Locke, Locke knows better than this. I'm not sure what about Barclay. Well, maybe there's something I don't understand about what they meant by algebra. But it almost seems like he's saying that algebra is like let A equal two and let B equal three. And then, uh, the, you know, we prove that A times B, I, I, I don't even know what a good example of this would be. I mean, why would you do it this way? I guess. Maybe let C equals four and let D equals one. And then we say, you know, A plus B equals C plus D. And therefore, A equals C plus D minus B. And therefore, we proved that 2 equals 4 plus 1 minus 3, which, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not a useful use of algebra, right? I mean, but maybe he's really thinking of a more, you know, like something like, where 
X is supposed to stand for some particular quantity, but you can't associate it with that quantity. Not only don't you, you can't associate it with that quantity before you solve the equation. So you're you're using it as the name of a certain quantity, but you don't know what quantity, <laughs> right? And then you perform some calculations, right? You say, well, whatever quantity it is, you know, this will be true. And then you say, well, you know, by the associative law, blah, 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 and you know, and you end up with X equals one. And now you know that all the, the whole time X was the name of for one. And so now if you want, you can you can put one back in any of these and you'll be guaranteed to get a true statement because the whole time X was a name for one. You just didn't know what it was in what quantity it was a name for. Okay, so um something like that is what he's thinking about algebra. I think uh, one way or the other, the point is that um the the x here is significant um not because it um refers to something outside my system of symbols namely a number in this case but rather just because i have a method of proceeding with it um the guarantee that in the end I can replace it with a particular number. And that that number will then make all of these other statements true. And what Barclay is saying is that all our words, and for example, the word one, <laughs> uh, are also like that that we don't have to know which idea they stand for when we operate with them. What we have is just like, um, um, A rule, like a rule, so to speak, by which we can replace any idea by this idea one. <laughs> and we can replace any other idea again by this idea one. And then we have rules for moving around the one and other number signs. And then at the end, we have rules where we can replace the number signs with ideas again. Right? So, like, I have an idea of an apple and I have this other idea of an apple. I have a rule by which I can replace this one with one and I can replace this one with one. Now, these are now standard words, right? And then I have a rule by which I can, you know, replace one and one by two. And then I have another rule that allows me to place two with an idea of two apples. And now if I followed all the rules, the idea should agree with, like, I can drop these two apples into a bag, do this calculation, and I look in the bag, I'll see this. <laughs> So it's like syntactic significance, not semantic significance. Um, which I know is probably not a helpful thing to say, and I would say more about it, but, um, well, let me just, even though I'm running over time a little bit, let me just say, um, Um, one more thing, because it's so important. So, um, 
So here's a question about this. And in the case of one where it can kind of be replaced by anything, maybe this doesn't come up as much, but so like, how does the, the, the word triangle signify? Well, I mean, there's like a rule by which you can exchange the word triangle, the idea of the word triangle, like the sound or the, the shape of it for various other ideas. Which other ideas? Well, the ideas that are triangles, right? So like, I, you know, if I have a statement like all triangles have three sides, then I can replace, I can, so to speak, cash that out <laughs> as uh, any particular idea of a triangle and it's three sides, <laughs> right? Um, uh, now, like, or I mean, that is, I can cash it out as any particular idea of the triangle, and then the other words has three sides. I can cash out as something about this idea, namely that it has three sides, right? Maybe that's not a good example because that's like the definition of a triangle. Let's say it's that the interior angles add up to two mm -hmm. right angles. Okay. So the question is though, now this idea comes in. How do I know whether this is one of the ideas I'm allowed to exchange with the word triangle or not? This is uh, Thomas Reed's objection to Berkeley, Berkeley, and I think uh, some of his successors actually misunderstand who agree with Berkeley kind of misunderstand this. How am I going to know? Well, I can't know by comparing it to the word, right? The word is an arbitrary sign. Can I know by by uh, comparing it to one of the other things that I've already used the word to stand for? Well, then maybe it's going to depend on which one I compare it to. That can't be right. So it seems like there must be be something that's really universal. Right, that I'm using, that somewhere I have a universal rule that I use to compare each idea that comes in. And if it, if it conforms to that rule, then I am allowed to exchange it with the word triangle, but if not, not. And isn't that my general or abstract idea? So I think Barclay's answer is going to be, that's not an idea. That's a principle of my will. Um, but wait, if it's not an idea, how can we talk about it? So this is where it's going to be important that Barclay doesn't think that the only use of language is to express ideas. OK, um, and I have I don't know gone over several minutes, so I will stop here. Um, and as I said, I hope we'll be in person on Monday, but I will uh, let you know as, as things develop what the plan is. Okay. See you later. Bye.